in there that says uh, that we're going, and I'm assuming everybody can hear me all right. And I want to start, I'll start sharing the presentation in a second. A couple just Zoom etiquette things. If uh, this is a, a first Zoom presentation for you, or you haven't seen one that looked quite like this before, uh, one of the um, one of the things that we noticed when we were testing it, the picture, it, once I start sharing, my picture is kind of on the top right side. You can click that and move it around. So uh, you can move my picture. So if I'm in the way of, uh, you know, whatever you're trying to read or something like that, you can slide those pictures around so that you don't have to, uh, so it doesn't get in the way of something that you're reading or that we're talking about. Um, the other thing is there's a slider, so you can do a split screen. If you want to look at my face while I'm talking and see it, you should be able to do that. Um, once again, really appreciate anybody <clears throat> enabling video. Um, it just really helps make the, um, make, the, make the session, I think, more valuable. I'm muting everybody right now because we're recording. You can unmute yourself if you have a question and you want to just jump in, or you can type questions in the chat. Um, and once again, we're just really excited to have you here and I'm excited that you're, you're joining us today. And if there's a chance for us to help you individually and, and, uh, there's a particular question, please don't hesitate to jump in. I, I can ramble on as much as you want, but I don't think that's the best way to do any kind of meeting, especially a virtual one. So we're going to get going here. Thank you for joining the, uh, advising college bound student athletes impacted by pandemic webinar. It's a special topic. We wanted to help people who were helping kids. Uh, so, you know, we try to come up with something that grabs everybody's attention right off the bat. And we wanted to talk about it's the enormous opportunity that college sports offers to uh, students who are looking to attend college. When most people think about college sports, they think about, you know, the big state school or Stanford or whatever, right, you know, and what's on CBS on a Saturday afternoon or, or something like that. And the reality is that's 400 schools out of about 2,500. There's an enormous amount of opportunity. I'm not gonna read through this graphic, but I do think that you can fool a lot of people. Uh, if you ask them what's the, the biggest NCAA division, the answer is division three. It's a way over 500 schools. And you think about how many student athletes are involved in that. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. And there's really a couple ways that being a high school student athlete or being an involved high school student really can help uh, in the college search process. Even if a student isn't really gung ho about playing a sport in college, contacting a college through a coach gives the aspiring student a completely different and I think much more uh, insider kind of view of the college. That coach can introduce prospective students to the people in admissions, the people in academics and academic support in financial aid without having to kind of go through the layers of uh, sort of outward facing admission structures that are meant to sort of help with flow and reduce people's access. So coaches can get students around all that and really give them the insider's perspective on a school. And that goes for kids at almost any level. I mean, as you look, there's almost 2,500 colleges if you want to play sports in college, there is a, there's kind of a butt for every seat, but there's also a seat for every butt. There's, there's programs at many, many different levels. And I think sometimes uh, we forget that you don't have to be the best player on your high school team to have a college that would be thrilled to have you join them and participate. So, uh, and, and people ask, why would colleges want to run athletic programs if they're not, you know, national level uh, competition? And the answer is, College athletics is the single least expensive, most effective student retention and success program that they can run. It's hugely cheaper than any other student support program and college athletes graduate at a super high rate. They, they're, they're usually 10 to 20 points ahead of the student body, sometimes more. Uh, they also tend to give money at a much higher rate. So there's some really uh, powerful incentives for colleges to support athletic teams and a lot of colleges do. Uh, let's talk about, obviously, pandemic-related waivers was, is a big topic. 
There's several that impact you if you're a school counselor. One of the big ones is that the NCAA and the NAI went test optional this year. You do not need to present a qualifying SAT score to be eligible to play as a freshman. It's that simple. In Division I, you need a 2.3 GPA. In Division II, you need a 2.2 GPA. Uh, we'll go to the NAI in a minute. I think it's really important. It's for the NCAA, that's a core course GPA. It's not the GPA that just on the transcript in terms of adding, you know, band and physical education. You've got a list of core courses you submit every year to the NCAA. Uh, it's really important, I think, to go into the NCAA portal and make sure that you've updated that list of classes and that they're approved because that's the list of classes that uh, the NCAA is going to require student athletes to, to use to satisfy those GPA requirements. Um, there are a couple of things about getting those core courses approved. The NCAA is very picky about the names of the classes because that's really all they can see. So it really helps if you do, you know, biology 10 dash something, if you're trying to make kind of a light biology class or something that you want the NCAA to approve, rather than, you know, human, human biology and reproduction or something, that's where the NCAA looks at that class and goes, no, that's an elective. So uh, just a little bit of advice there. Also, if they do, if they don't accept a class, you know, you have a period of time to appeal and, you know, they're, they're pretty reasonable and it's worth reaching out to them and talking to the eligibility center yourself. They're, they'll, they have a phone number on there um, and they're, they're really helpful. They're, you know, they're, they're, it's like any other large organization. You can get different answers on different days from different people, but it's really uh, worth interacting with them. Just if for no other reason, you know, it gives you an opportunity to uh, get a little knowledge and, and build a relationship with somebody over there. So if you do have a bigger question, you can say, hey, I talked to this person before. And I think you'll be surprised how helpful they are. Um, the other big change was pass-fail grading. I know a lot of high schools and parents really agonized about pass-fail grading this, this spring semester and spring quarter and what are we going to do? And, uh, and there was a lot of misinformation out there. It's been uh, scary to watch for me kind of being on both sides of the desk and <clears throat> this is the standard that the NCAA is going to apply uh, to students in COVID impacted semesters going forward so this is if you're a sophomore this is how these classes are going to impact your GPA uh, you can if you get a grade this the NCAA is going to accept the school's determination about a grade uh, if there's a pass or pass fail, the NCAA will look at that pass fail in two different ways depending on the student's GPA. If counting that pass as a 2.3 helps that student's GPA, the NCAA will look at it as a 2.3 and include it. If it won't, so if you have a kid who's a 3.0 student or a 3.5 student, it's just a pass. They don't count toward GPA at all, it just counts as a completed core course. And the NCAA requires, you know, 16 core courses, I think it is. Uh, to be eligible. So, and that COVID waiver on pass fails is going to follow students all the way through their academic career. So even we come out of pandemic and we're back at school and grading and everything else, that COVID semester is still going to be counted that way by the NCAA. So um, that won't hurt them. The other thing, the whole conversation about counting passes as a D or that pass fail is going to hurt kids in terms of GPA, uh, College admissions offices do not, generally speaking, count pass-fail grades as deeds. Generally speaking, college admissions offices count them as no grade. Like, you, got, you get credit for the class, but it doesn't count to your GPA because the school didn't give you a grade. And that's it. They don't, I don't think, I was at Emory University, I was at Wisconsin Stout, I've been in other places. I've never seen an admissions office penalize a student for pass-fail grading. The NCAA came up with penalizing students for pass-fail grading because they have people trying to start high schools in garages. And one of the things those guys did is pass fail grading to try to hide the fact that kids weren't really doing the work. But that's not uh, an admissions office issue. It's not something that's standard at colleges. It was an NCAA decision based on a specific set of problems. So um, people extrapolated from that. And I, I really want to encourage people to not extrapolate that because I don't, I don't believe it's accurate at all. Uh, the other piece that I, I want to really emphasize is every college admissions officer was working from home 
for the past three months. You know, they're trickling back in now, I guess. But as you can see, everybody's working from home right now. Every admissions officer, every coach, every college advisor, professor, everybody knows that this is a pandemic semester or pandemic quarter. And I really think colleges are going to be looking at students' academic records without this semester. Everybody knows this semester was kind of a mess. And I don't think anybody's looking at grades this semester or pass fail from an admissions perspective and going, this is going to help us predict how the student will perform in college. I think that we're going to, admissions offices look at seven semesters because the second semester, you have eight semesters in a high school career, spring semester, senior year, they don't really look at. So it's seven. And I think basically colleges are going to start saying, we'll go to six. We're just going to look at the whatever six semesters, but we're not going to look at this COVID semester because high schools weren't ready for the transition. Kids weren't ready. Um, the grading's been kind of crazy all over the place. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody wants to look at it that way. Uh, one person's asking about whether the COVID pass fail policy will extend beyond the semester. And I think as long as semesters are COVID impacted, this policy is going to continue. And in fact, the NCAA doesn't have to do anything to continue it. This is, this is their new policy uh, really for COVID impacted semesters. So if schools are still online, various things, uh, I think you're gonna see this extend and it's gonna extend and follow students even when we come out of pandemic for these semesters or for these quarters. Uh, the other issue with uh, pass fail grading and sort of policies beyond this semester is that uh, you do not need the NCAA's waiver. They used to want to approve if you went from in-person instruction to online, you had to file some paperwork with the NCAA to make it count. They've waived that. If you're a, if you're a school and you're providing accredited instruction and you change to online, they, they don't require any specific paperwork. So um, they're, they're really trying to streamline that process. And the NCAA, I, want, I do want to emphasize people, uh, there's a whole industry of complaining about the NCAA and how they handle eligibility, excuse me, and what they do for uh, students and how they're difficult. And the reality is that the NCAA in the midst of pandemic has done about as well as any large organization can do. You know, the, the Ivy League and then the NCAA were the first organization to uh, cancel competition in the face of pandemic. And then they were the first ones to come up with the waiver policy. They've been really proactive. Uh, they've taken some stick for not being faster and you know you go back to that first slide and there's 1200 ncaa institutions that all get a vote so uh i, th I think they've been about as fast as a 1200 member organization could possibly be and i i do want to really make sure i sort of send that shout out to them because they've 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 done about as well as humanly possible for any large organization in an incredibly challenging environment and i know all of us understand how challenging this is. And um, they, I think the NCAA is one of those moments where they rose to the challenge. I think if we're gonna criticize them when they don't, it's important to point out when they did. Uh, the NAI also issued a COVID waiver. The NAI also went test optional. Uh, their new standard is an 18 ACT or a 970 SAT to be eligible as a freshman. And uh, they waived that. If you have a 2.0, you're eligible to play in the NAI. And the NAI does not recalculate GPA. So that's a 2.0 overall GPA. So students who don't make the NCAA eligibility guidelines, many there are many students who won't make the NCAA guidelines, even with a 2.3, who are eligible to play and get funded in the NAI. And so that's worth understanding. And um, you know, there's 265 NAI schools, and they're all over the country. And many of them are, are quite good. And I think if a student sees their initial eligibility pathway blocked and that's making it less likely for them to go off to college, uh, the NAI does offer a viable option there. And, uh, and uh, from a competition standpoint, uh, one of the things that we like to share is I've heard people say, well, what NCAA, uh, what NCAA division or what division is the most competitive? And I think there's a misunderstanding about what competitive means. Uh, the, you know, obviously the top end of division one in any sport, you know, Stanford, Michigan, those kind of schools, the level of play is higher, right? The, the student athletes are elite. Uh, it's just a different level. 
when you get beyond that level, even within Division I, uh, and particularly outside of football and basketball, uh, where they're headcount sports, anybody in football, anybody in basketball gets a, that's in Division I is getting what's called a full ride, right? They're getting tuition, room, board, books, fees, everything. There's no, they don't pay to go to college. But that's only in Division I, and it's only in headcount sports, which is football, basketball, and women's volleyball. Everything else is an equivalency sport. So uh, colleges give out $200 million in aid every year for athletics. And to give out the amount of money that would be necessary for every kid who tells everybody they got a full ride to get a full ride, it'd be 25 trillion. There's no way. Uh, as a college coach, I got a million stories about kids that we recruited to walk on telling everybody they got a full ride. Everybody likes that term. It's really popular. Uh, that's not really the, what people get. And, um, you know, so the, there, there is, a, generally speaking, students are paying for college. Um, let's talk about just really quickly, just the standard graduation requirements for division one. They're looking for four, 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 four. They want you to take at least four core courses every semester of your high school career, right? So four English, they say three math, two science, but if you add it up, that says four additional courses, pretty much you're supposed to take English, math, science, and social science every semester. Do those things you're gonna be fine. That's your 16 core courses. Uh, and they want a 2.3 GPA in those core courses. So that's, that's division one. And they have some rules about, there aren't in the graphic here, uh, about how you satisfy those 16 core courses. You can't you know, kind of rush and take 10 core courses your senior year or your junior year for division one. So it's really important that kids get on track early and stay on track. In division two, they're more flexible. It adds up to 16 core courses, uh, but they only require a 2.2. And in Division Two, they don't dictate the pace. So it's got to add up to 16 core courses, but it doesn't necessarily um, have to be 4444. Somebody could load up, take a couple core classes in the summer at a community college, something like that and still be eligible in division two. And that's becoming, it used to be that it was a test score thing. The SAT score was a little low. Now you're a division two qualifier, not division one. Um, now it's really about their academic program. Uh, I think if we continue with COVID disrupted semesters and it's hard to take testing, I think the NCAA is gonna waive testing again next year. As more schools get test optional, my thought is that I think it's very likely that the NCAA drops the test requirement entirely and just goes GPA. I, I think having a robust core course requirement and a GPA is enough of a standard to make sure that students come into college ready to go. And I think there's real questions about what the SAT provides. And if the SAT is going to a um, uh, online, some kind of online thing, especially after the AP, the way the AP testing has gone, I think colleges are going to uh, kind of move away from that. I think they've already got the test optional thing most places. And I, I don't see the the will in the NCAA to continue using the SAT if it's not valid. And I think there's, you can make arguments about whether it's valid now. If you start talking about take home and people can't take it and it's not widely available, uh, I don't see the NCAA sticking with it. And I think the NAI, if the NCAA drops the SAT, the NAI will drop it as well. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about you know, so how do you, we got a student and they're like, hey, I, my recruiting just got destroyed. I can't go to my AAU tournament. I can't play. Uh, my high school baseball season got canceled. What, what am I going to do? Coaches aren't going to see me. And the, the reality is, I think students have an incredible opportunity, even in this sort of disrupted uh, moment, to really reset their college search and really make that search about them and empower themselves in their college search. We talk about a 5A college search process. We have assessment, alignment, adjustment, application, and admission. Uh, the application piece and the admission piece are kind of later in the game, and that's not as pandemic. Uh, we're not really talking about how the pandemic impacts those. But I think the first three, assessment, uh, when we talk about assessment, we're talking about really students getting to know what they want for themselves. I think 
COVID has changed some of the student answers. You know, there's students who now don't want to go as far from home. There are other students now that they've been cooped up for a few weeks. They're like, uh, is there some place on a different continent I can go to college so I can get away from my siblings or whatever? That's cool too. But those, those answers are changing. I think when you talk about assessment, we have on our website a very uh, quick, like 10 minute questionnaire that students can fill out. And then we come back with some recommendations. And if you want to push students to use that, I think it really, the purpose of our assessment is to help a student think in a sort of a semi-organized and, and graphic way, because people don't like to read, uh, you know, what's your geographic goals for college? What kind of environment do you learn best in? You know, what are you interested in? I talk to students all the time who say, well, I want to go to college at UCLA. I want to play, I want to play soccer for UCLA. Cool. Tell me about what you think of a lecture hall with 900 people. Oh, I don't want to be in a lecture with 900 people. Nobody's going to know where I'm even there. Well, then you don't want to play at UCLA because you can't decouple those two things. You've got to be willing to go to a big class. If you're going to go to Oregon, you know, you got to accept that you're going to be in some big lectures. If you want professors to know your name and you want to be in small classes, there are other colleges that are a terrific fit and have athletics and have great programs and could be a great fit for you. You know, Middlebury is a pretty good school. And you're not going to be in a class more than about 25 people. And if they want you, that's a great fit. So that assessment piece, um, and I think the answers have changed, but you being a skilled counselor and guiding students through that process of introspection and counseling, that has not changed. That's, that's where I think the biggest value we all add is helping students with the assessment piece. And then I think the biggest difference between what I do and, and being a school-based counselor in terms of alignment is just you know, I've been on 2,500 college campuses in the last 10 years. Um, it's pretty, you know, I, I can talk nationally about a lot of different options. Um, but I think the same thing that you guys do, matching students, you know, their academic profile uh, and their academic interests and their athletic interests with, you know, and, and figuring out fit, you know, is, are you going to be a good fit at this institution and coming up with a kind of a list of schools where a student is gonna be a good fit in terms of cost, in terms of learning environment, in terms of geography, uh, in terms of, you know, they wanna to go to med school or they don't, things like that. And uh, my one recommendation in terms of determining alignment is I think there's a huge disruption in higher education and the class of 2021, they don't realize it yet and there's a lot of conflicting information online but the class of 2021, and I think the class of 2022, hit the jackpot. It's going to be easier to get into colleges. Colleges are getting less selective, and colleges are lowering their price, flat out. And they're not going to announce lowering tuition, but the reality is these schools are lowering their cost. So, you know, when you assess a kid and you think, well, that school's probably a reach because they're not in the they're not above the 50th percentile in terms of admitted students. I'm not sure that's a good, uh, you know, if you're looking at pre-COVID admissions numbers or this year's admissions numbers, which are gonna be probably somewhat statistically not valid uh, and colleges are gonna use different methods to try to count them and sort of, I don't wanna say hide what they're doing, but I don't think any college wants to admit they just emptied their wait list and started calling kids that they rejected. And a lot of colleges are doing just that. Uh, and the colleges have a two-sided problem, right? They've got uh, COVID and pandemic, and can we even have class live this fall? What's that going to look like? What's sports going to look like? Uh, but they also have the NACAC settlement, where colleges had to agree to allow poaching, allow colleges to offer discounts and recruit students who'd already deposited and already committed to schools. So it was already going to be kind of the Wild West. And then you threw in a massive disruption and billion dollar budget holes on that. Uh, I don't think we've seen the, all the implications sorted out. The, the cost of college is dropping. And I don't think there's much most colleges can do to change that. Uh, the Ivy League's already doing tuition remission. They say, well, we don't give athletic money. and We don't give merit aid. Okay, but if you make under $150,000 a year, you're free at Harvard automatically. You know, they don't give, Princeton doesn't give merit aid, but they have endowment scholarships. Like, I don't care if they call it a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon. If they want you, it's cheap. I was at Emory. We, we had a kid. We, we, she was committed. She was coming. And then two weeks before school started, Hopkins offered her more money. And she went to Hopkins. 
Um, that's going on at that level all the time. And the only check on the on the on any of it is in the Ivy League, the schools share a common database. So the schools can see if Harvard says you're free, Dartmouth knows. Um, so the next part is adjustment. And I think this is where it's really challenging, helping students raise their academic profile. Because you go through assessment, you figure out what you want, alignment, what are the colleges that are a good fit? Where do I want to go? And then you think about what do I need to change in my resume, in my academic profile to make me a really great fit for that school. And I think, you know, raising GPA, changing your academic profile, getting uh, another core course in, those are issues that are more challenging, you know, in pandemic. There's options, there's online, there's various things, but that's, I think, going to be the biggest challenge for counselors is helping students with that adjustment phase. So you can really arm them to reach their goals and get where they want to get to. Um, we're talking with students and saying, you know, what can I do in pandemic? I, I don't go to school. We don't have practice. We're not traveling. And, you know, you can kind of go two ways, right? You can binge watch Netflix. Lots of people do. Or you can binge do. And you can take this time. You know, for some people, their environment is, is so negative or they're so challenged that just getting by is a success. And for those students, we want to support that. But if you can use the time to explore an academic interest, I got a friend who found himself to be fluent in Chinese on YouTube over the last six months. Um, now he lived in China before that and various things, but, but he definitely used you know, Khan Academy and YouTube videos to become from, from being a struggling speaker to a fluent Chinese speaker. If a student wants to explore an academic interest, if they want to get fit, you know, one of the barriers to getting fit is practice. You know, kids are running from practice to work, school they're at school and they go to practice then they go to work or they go to work and they practice or they got basketball practice and then there's like a soccer practice uh, and it's tough to really build fitness well all that's canceled you want to get fit get fit you want to build hey i'm not that good i'm i'm basketball player and i'm not really good on my left side you know my left hand's not as good as my right i'm a soccer player and i'm one footed well you know your house still has a, if you got a house or an apartment you got a wall right you got a ball okay here, here's 200,000 hours of YouTube videos about how to get better at that. Uh, we have some on our site. There's millions of options. Uh, the other thing we, I always try to tell students, you know, we talk about the broken leg test when you pick a college, you know, coaches are great, athletics are great, but if you never played again, if you get hurt the first day, you step in a hole and you're done, uh, do you want to be there? Because if the answer is no, that's the wrong school, right? Everybody knows that. Uh, the other part of it is colleges give out $200 million a year in athletic aid. That's a lot of money. But, and none of it goes in a Coke machine. You cannot buy a soda with any of that money. It's a discount. You're still paying. But the bigger piece is that the same colleges that give out $200 million in athletic aid give out over $2 billion a year academically. When a student raises their GPA by one-tenth of a point, they get more money someplace. If you go from 2.2 GPA to 2.4, you have increased your world of opportunity. If you go from 2.4 to 2.7, you've increased your world of opportunity. You go from 3.9 to 4.0, same thing. And I think sometimes students go, oh, you know, I didn't do very well as a freshman or sophomore. And uh, there's nothing I can do now. My GPA is never going to get to 3.5. Well, okay, cool. But if you go from 2.4 to 2.6, man, you just made money. And, and sometimes I think we undersell that message. You know, you have a ton more options at 2.7 than at 2.5. You have a ton better options, cheaper options. You know, every school has a matrix where they give money based on some GPA or SAT profile. And those, they're eliminating the SAT profile. And, you know, you raise your GPA by a point or two and you're in a different little box and you're getting more. Um, the other thing is for colleges, the biggest predictor of success is what you're doing in high school, right? Like your high school GPA is the best predictor of your college GPA. So the more students do to work hard and do the best they can, you know, in the classroom and then also in athletics, that's what's going to sell them. And so anything they can do to improve during the pandemic that hits their interests. My daughter, she's really into androids right now. She's five and a half. And so we, we're, we're getting this kit and we're going to try to build a robot, you know, I don't know, probably end up in pieces all over the garage, but uh, you know, we're going to give that a try because she's interested. I mean, this is a great opportunity 
you know, we put in 20 bucks. It's no big deal. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to, to explore whatever interests kids have. And, you know, they can, they can be the people who drive that. Um, the other piece is it's a dead period. The NCAA has extended the dead period through June 30th. And the basketball coach associations are already pushing for the end for July 30th at a minimum. The other part is this is the silliest dead period in history. Where are you going to go? There's literally nobody to watch and you really don't want to home visit somebody. Right. I mean, that's kind of crazy. So uh, it's a dead period that, you know, the NAI is having a dead period too, because there's nowhere to go and you don't want to home visit most places. So um, what can students do? The biggest piece is to reach out in a personalized way to a coach. Um, you know, do a little research, find out about the schools you've done. Once you've done your assessment and you've done your alignment, you've got a list of schools, whether it's 10 or 15 or five, of coaches you'd really like to get in touch with. And how do you do it? Well, you write an email. My name is, you know, Jenny Jones, and I'm really interested in your college because it has this major and it has this athletic program and I play this position and I'm going to graduate here. And then what do you put in that email? You want to make sure you talk about why that college is a fit. If you have a form email, make sure there's a couple sentences that you're changing so that you can tell that coach why you're looking at that school. Coaches get a ton of form generated emails. A lot of them are generated by software. Uh, saying, you know, hey, coach, I'm interested in your college, okay? And those are going to 2,000 schools, and you delete them. It's a great way to get recruited by a school that is in a place no one wants to go because those, those are the people who answer those emails. If you're at a school where nobody wants to go, those are the emails you get, those are the emails you answer. But at any school where anybody would want to go, uh, you're getting emails that talk to you personally. And so if a student wants a response and a quick response from a coach, the more personalized it is, the more they explain why they're a great fit for the college and they explain why uh, that college is a good fit for them, uh, the more likely they're going to get a response. The other thing, and I'm going to try to share this with you here. Let's see if I can do it. I'm sort of technically, there we go. So I don't know, if are you seeing our athletic resume on there? Okay, so I, there's a Google form that we sent and I tried to upload this uh, to the chat box. It didn't, I don't know that it took. Um, if you want me to email it to you directly, I'm happy to do it. Um, this is a Word document. You can right click over here and change the picture. Um, Jamie, Jamie's not gonna take that personally if you put your own picture in there. And um, you, it gives you a place for pretty much everything, links to, uh, you know, academic things, statistics, leadership, references, a couple things that are really important here. One of them is, uh, let me see if I can go back to that. Here we go. Sorry about that. I'm switching between, between things here. Um, there we go. Okay, now I can see what I'm doing again. Uh, a couple things that are really important in that resume. Um, one of them is references. Coaches can't travel, right? So the Coconut Telegraph is the biggest recruiting thing. It's always been the biggest recruiting thing and people didn't talk about it. And now it's the only recruiting thing. Um, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, like having a, co having a coach's name and phone number on your resume, if I'm a college coach, I'm desperate to talk to those coaches. And it's huge when a student sends that out for your entire school, because when I'm, if I'm a smart high school or a smart college coach and I get that resume, it gives me an opportunity to have a productive conversation with that high school coach or that club coach. And I'm not just, first of all, I can find out about a student because, you know, even if I see a kid at a tournament or something, I mean, okay, the kid dunked a basketball or, you know, scored a goal or something like that. Yay them. Uh, but what kind of person are they? Do I want them on the team? I got to live with them for four years. I want to ask their coach, like, hey, what do you think of this kid? And, and that's really important. The second part is it's an opportunity for the coach to represent the entire school. So, cause when I call a high school coach on, Hey, you know, like, so we talk about Sally and, and or talk about Jimmy and what he does and what his strengths and weaknesses are, you know, tell me about, some, do you have anybody else that we ought to be talking to? And now your coach is advocating for your whole school. 
and it's not just people think, well, it's just in basketball or something. One of the things that made my career is we recruited a young woman uh, and we weren't getting any traction at all. And our, I was the women's soccer coach and our football coach said, Hey, I have a friend there. And so the football coach tell it, the football coach kind of connection thing, this kid was really tight with one of her teachers who was a football assistant. And he was in with one of our, you know, we recruited kids out of there for football all the time. And she ended up coming because of the relationships that other coaches had in her building and in the relation and luckily really positive relationships that we had in our building. Um, so you just never know. And whenever, if you can get one student to send a resume with a coach's contact information, you're really improving college opportunity for your whole school. And then that kid is being a really great team player and helping the whole school. And, you know, you just want to make sure your coaches put their best foot forward and that kind of thing. And I think most high school coaches are terrific and they do. Uh, the other big thing is include a link to video if you have it. You know, no coach can watch it. Coaches can't drive someplace and watch a game now. So the only option they have is, is video. You can upload a video to YouTube for free. I'm a very, uh, I really strongly advocate not signing up for paid for athletic recruiting services. They are based, that they're the descendants of boiler room operations where a kid would be in the local paper and they'd call them and then they would fax a, a little resume thing to every college in the United States and we would throw them away. Like it was a mass tree killing operation. Uh, and those, they've moved online and they're still terrible and they still send emails that are spam and get filtered in college coaches. And if a kid's sending emails through like NCSA, 99% of college coaches never see those emails because they're spam filtered. Because it's a spoof email. So it's literally destroying their recruiting. They think they reached out to a coach and the coach never saw it. Just use your own account, email them a link to your YouTube video, upload your, um, that resume to a Google document, send this coach a link to the Google document and the YouTube video, and now you've done it for free. Peyton, I'm glad I could validate that. Um, it drives me nuts because, you know, I, we, we advise students. People say, well, aren't you just a recruiting service? And I'm like, we're not a recruiting service at all. We help students navigate the recruiting process and find a great fit. We're not sending things uh, to, you know, 10,000 colleges because that's not helpful. Uh, unless you have a kid who just doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't care where they go and you want to get them out of the house. And then we can, you know, everybody can mass email. Um, I don't know what, uh, I know NCSA, Captain U, I don't know what Sports Recruits is, he, I'm sorry. Um, but it's probably owned by the company that owns NCSA, to be honest, because they own 80% of the businesses in that space. Um, the, uh, the other things you can do is understand there's some rules about how coaches can respond. In the NCAA, basically coaches can respond to juniors and seniors. It's a little trickier with sophomores. Sophomores should still send it out because a, a college coach can call the sophomore's coach and talk to that coach, and the coach can pass on that there was a conversation. So uh, it's really easy, but they can't just call them back. Also, excuse me, if a coach, um, if you call a coach and they pick up the phone, they can talk to you. So you just have to keep calling, but they can't return the phone call. Um, that's, that's a big deal. The other thing is understand that, you know, no feedback is feedback. Um, you know, it, it's, um, it's really frustrating. Like if, if a kid emails a coach and they just really don't respond to two or three emails, you know, that's feedback. Um, and, and it's okay. You know, not, not every college is, is right for every kid. Um, and I, I do think the best thing I can do to empower you on recruiting services is send them to our site to look around and look at how different it is. You know, and say, hey, look, this is, this is a college coach who helps students find colleges. And, you know, he, he does all the stuff for free. And, um, you know, you can make with a YouTube video and a Google document the exact same thing that you're paying thousands of dollars for. And then your emails don't get filtered. And that's what I would tell people first gen when I like, you know, the club coaches, the, the clubs are getting paid. And I get it, but, um, and some of the stuff is great. Like there's a college fit finder that where, and there's a field level where students can sign up for a free account and coaches can recommend them. And it puts their information out there for coaches to search. 
Uh, but paying for that stuff, I think, is crazy. Um, and that, you know, it's an opinion, but I think it's an educated one. Uh, in terms of putting your best foot forward in recruiting, the other things you can talk about is make sure your social media represents you the way you want to be seen, right? I mean, there's a million workshops about don't, don't, don't. What about do? Shouldn't your Twitter account show what a great teammate you are? Shouldn't your Instagram account show how much fun you're having playing that sport in high school and how hard you're working? I mean, couldn't that, shouldn't those social media pieces tell the story of why you're succeeding and how you're going to succeed later? That, because that's really critical because even, even an old guy like me knows how to search Facebook or Instagram, right? Like, I'll take a look. Uh, the other thing is make sure you clean up your email. You know, if you're like, super sexy 420 at gmail like that was funny when you were 12 now it's time to clean it up start a college email uh the real easy one is just you know david jones 2021 at you know gmail.com nice and easy then you just have to make sure they check it because they create new emails and then they don't look at them and then you know that the breakdown goes there the other thing is make sure if you're looking at joining at playing in an NCA institution, register for the clearinghouse. You can register for free and do the profile and upload everything. And if you end up playing in division three, you don't pay anything. Um, if you want to have be certified, um, you know, in that, like, you know, be certified, then they have to pay the NCAA, you know, you guys know, like you do the upload the fee waiver. It just asks whether you, does this kid deserve a waiver? You say yes, they get a waiver. Um, it's not, they're not asking for any data. Same with the NAIA. Um, Play NAIA is the NAIA's eligibility center. Make sure that you, you know, keep that up to date as well. Um, it always, I, I think you want to make sure you do those just as a check off at the beginning of the year. And then it's really easy to upload waivers and things like that. Um, Kay's asking about, uh, club teams using sports recruits and the kids don't pay the, for any of those free sites. If a kid wants to put their stuff online, it's just searchable. Uh, it's the paying that's the problem. Like having the, having it searchable and um, just understand that, you know, it's something that the kid can send a coach to or something like that. But if they create a resume and things like that, I mean, if I'm a coach that shows demonstrated interest in my school and I'm much more likely to respond. So that's the, that's what the big benefit to doing it yourself is. Um, and the sort of mass stuff, is you know it's a way to do it that's all and but I, I think the there's very little payoff for getting paid and, and a lot of times the recruiting people say well we got a kid a scholarship and it's like you know you got your kid a discount which we'll talk about in a minute but that discount was available to any student like they didn't need to pay for ncsa or something that anybody gets that um we have a, a dynamic dual track timeline which i hope some of you looked at when we sent out an email um, college athletic advisor dual track timeline that link um, gets you you know things to do as a freshman sophomore uh, spring junior year fall junior year and it has links to the clearinghouse common app fafsa because you can start doing your you know federal student aid things as, you know as a junior now so um, that really helps keep people on track and it's dynamic so you can click on it and get to college board's website you know, and see if they're going to offer the SAT anytime, things like that. Um, so I did want to talk very quickly about what college costs. And the big takeaways are, um, you know, the sticker prices, from a college standpoint, the sticker price of a college is generally an aspirational number. They don't actually, for private schools, they don't actually charge that. Um, most private schools don't have a mechanism to collect it. Like they automatically discount every single kid. Um, also make sure you advise students, or at least I would suggest that a, an academic scholarship discount is just as good as an athletic scholarship discount. Like the, if you get $10,000 academically or athletically, it's $10,000 discount. It doesn't make a difference whether it's for sports or not. Um, the NAI is based on the idea that people will pay more to take an athletic scholarship than an academic one. And I, I coached in the NAI also, and it, but that never made sense to me. And I, I, I would encourage you to help educate people about that. Uh, the last part is that, you know, cheap isn't value and expensive isn't quality. You know, there's, there's schools that will discount to, to be very, very inexpensive. If it's not the right place to go to school, don't go strictly for that last dollar, right? 
you can find another school that'll be affordable too. That's a good fit. You know, if you, if you're like, well, I wouldn't, if your answer is I would not come here except for the money. Gosh, I don't, you know, I hope that you got a better option. Let's, let's work on that. Cause that's not a great answer. You're going to spend four years of your life there. And so, a, you know, a dis making it half price in return for four years of your life, isn't that good a deal. And someone else will get you to half price too. Um, and when you talk about paying for college, to me, there's three buckets, right? The first bucket is your money. You write a check. The second bucket is money that it's called for a college. It calls it bring the student brings that money to the school. It can be a grant like a Pell grant or, a, you know, in Iowa, there's a state grant. Um, it can be loan money because it's a loan for you and you got to pay it back for the college. You sign up for that loan. The federal government sends that school a check. So that's a bring. And then the third bucket is discounts. And so I put a little coupon up here and some people kind of object to calling it a coupon thing, but it really is, you know, it's, it's a discount. Like if, when I buy a car, they go, Hey, I got a rebate program. Like I realize they're not giving me, you know, a thousand dollars. It's just a discount. Right. Uh, and it's the same thing, whether it's an academic award, an institutional award, the WUI grant, if you're on the West coast, uh, people get really excited about WUI and it's literally every school decides what WUI means for that school. So they can, they can make it whatever they want. There's no like, there's a WUI website and a WUI thing, but it doesn't, uh, schools just say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be WUI. And then they decide how they're going to divvy up that discount, you know, whether it's an endowment grant or something like that. Um, athletic grants and aid. So NCAA division one and two, the NAIA, those schools offer athletic grants and aid. NCAA division three, um, some other affiliations don't use um, don't use those um, they don't use athletic grants, but I mean a Division three school can make school just as affordable as a Division one school. You know there's, it's merit they, they'll discount in a different way, and the coach isn't the one individually determining the discount. Uh, that's the primary difference. So just to understand that. Um, and I really agree, Lynn, I think. It is tough. I think the big piece is for students to fill out the websites is fine. It's just, you know, save the money because you, you're going to need it for college and the discounts you're getting are, are, you know, that you can get them without being in the recruiting service. Um, that's kind of the end of the plan presentation piece. I'm going to try to unmute everybody here. Um, um, here's my, uh, here's my uh, presentation, website. Presentation website. Uh, let's see here. I'm going uh, to mute it for a second. I'm going to mute it for a second. Because I'm, I'm hearing some feedback. But I want to encourage, I guess I'm going to encourage you to unmute yourself. What kind of questions do you guys have? How can I help you? That was, that was a long monologue. It was really one, helpful. One, one question I have is, uh, should we encourage students incoming as freshmen to begin the NCAA clearinghouse? Uh, the NCAA suggests doing it as a sophomore. I'm a big fan of waiting till sophomore year. I don't think there's that big a rush. I think you can encourage kids as freshmen to sort of look at that college bound student athlete booklet. It's free online, you just download it, and it has the core courses. And I think it'll help them sort of figure out what they wanna sign up for as freshmen a little bit and, and save them some headaches down the line. But I wouldn't encourage any freshman to sign up for the clearinghouse. I think wait, wait till sophomore year. Lynn's asking what doesn't work. I, I have to say, I think um, it's tough for students to get coaches' attention uh, if they're kind of fishing in the wrong pond. You know, if you're sending stuff to uh, you know, UCLA and you're not a national class athlete, that's, that's going to be tough. I think if you're not getting feedback, expanding your universe of people that you email and really making sure that those emails are well-written and personal, um, and that you don't do the, uh, CC and email 10 coaches on one email. There's some things that students tend to do that are really self-defeating and that that's 10 of them right there. I think if you send a coach a personal email, you know, I'm interested in your school for these reasons, and it's clear that you wrote it to that coach. 
I think 99% of coaches respond to those emails. Uh, because, it, I mean, having been on the other side, boy, those, those, they make an impression because you don't see those as often. You, know, you get the recruiting spam emails all the time. What's the latest that a student can sign up for the NCAA Clearinghouse? Uh, the day before school starts their freshman year. Like they could sign up now. Okay. And, and be certified. It's just, I've had kids sign up after they actually were attending college. Okay. Because you can't play. So you have to go back and, and do everything. And have so your kids really know. Yeah, because you, well, you can start practicing, but you can't play until they certify. Okay. So you've never completely missed the boat. They'll always try to figure it out. Perfect. Thank you. Um, oh, the other thing that doesn't, I think the other thing that does, a barrier for students is if you make a video, um, and you can make a video that's just you in your backyard. Uh, the barrier would be just make sure there's enough context so coaches can see what you're doing. The example is like, if you're playing baseball and you throw the ball and I see you throw it really hard, I do need to see where it landed. You know, because if, if you're throwing it to somebody, you know, 10 feet away and it went over your house, I need to know that. Um, I remember getting a soccer video where the context was so tight like the kid dove and made a save. It was a goalkeeper and the went black. So why did he dive? Like, was he in the wrong place? Uh, what just happened? Like they showed him punting the soccer ball, not where it landed. Okay, that's great looking. He kicked the ball, but like, what, why, where did it go? That, that was not helpful. Um, but almost anything else, I mean, coaches are running around. They can't go to tournaments. They've lost some of the ways that they identify students. This is a great time to step up. Um, another great question about cutting programs. I think you're going to see some D1, especially sort of mid-majors, cutting a few high-cost sports, you know, like baseball or lacrosse. Um, overall, colleges are under huge enrollment pressure. So the number of spots for athletes is going to go up, not down. So there's going to be some very well-publicized cuts. Cincinnati cut men's soccer uh, a month ago, I think. Uh, but all over the United States, colleges are looking for students. The NAI just approved flag football for women. Excuse me. There's going to be uh, the, the NCAA essentially lifted their scholarship caps because if you're a COVID impacted student athlete, you can play and get scholarship and your scholarship doesn't count towards the limits. So I think you're going to see uh, rosters get bigger. Colleges offer more opportunities in aggregate. But at the very highest end in Division I, uh, I think there's going to be some really visible cuts. Uh, there's also talk about furloughing coaches, which to me indicates that even though schools are announcing they're going to be in person and they're going to do in-person instruction, and yeah, we're going to play this fall, there's some serious planning for not playing and some serious planning for being online in the fall. Uh, so I would, I would just be aware of that, that I think there's an opportunity for these colleges to pivot and I don't think it's 50-50. I think that it's likely, you know, we're in the midst of a big experiment right now where we're going to open things up and we'll see what happens. Um, but I think uh, the reality is it's likely that colleges are going to be largely restricted to online instruction. And I think that's going to limit, you know, fall sports participation. But I think it's not going to limit recruiting for 2021. Colleges are going to still need students. So I think overall, there's going to be more opportunity. Um, Julie's asking, what would you ask for a new college counselor? I think the biggest thing I would tell you if you're, if you're new to college counseling is, um, you know, reach out to your coaches and ask them what they're doing. Uh, and if the answer is not very much, the biggest thing is helping students email coaches individually because those connections and have them list you as a character reference because some coaches will call you and building those relationships as a new college counselor, I think is the, one of the best things you can do for your students to have relationships at different colleges. Um, for students, one of the good places is the NCAA. They have a guide for college bound student athletes. Uh, I know our dual track timeline has links to all kinds of things, all kinds of resources. Um, I think, you know, clearly Facebook has tons of information. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, things like that. But the, the biggest piece to me is help students understand that it's a college search. 
and help them with that piece that in, and you know, what's a good academic fit? What's a good social fit? What's good for their learning style? What's good? What's going to meet their interest? And then you look at the sport and you go, okay, here are the schools that, that fit that, um, that op- offer this opportunity that you're interested in and kind of go from, and I, I would go from there. And I think that's the biggest thing you can do. And I think as you do that actively with students, you'll be amazed how many people you interact with and how helpful it is because there's, there's tons of coaches and admissions people and just uh, resources in the community with um, relationships that'll help you sort of build your, your ability to help and build your, build your knowledge base, but also kind of build a level of understanding, you know, of how to help students. Is that, uh, go ahead. I think being realistic with the kids too, cause you know, I've seen it with rising ninth graders. Oh, my kid's going to be a D one pro ball player and he has a 1.3 GPA, you know, and, it, and just being realistic with them. Like it's like how we're realistic with them academically about where you can go. I think we got to be realistic with them athletically as well. And I, like, as you were talking about it, I had one of my runners was texting me, asking me, okay, I'm going to be a junior in a couple of weeks. So what should I start doing? You know, what should I, should I email the coaches? Where should I look at? I said, well, let's talk. And literally you were on that slide about assessment and everything. So I just said, we, we got to talk. So, uh, um, you know, I told him, I said, right now, just see where you see where you want to go. General idea. See where you fit academically. Um, email the coaches, ask them what their standards are. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, to me, I think being realistic, especially with the kid with a low GPA saying, listen, you can't play at Stanford or at UCLA or UW or wherever if you don't have the grades to play. Right. So this is what you got to take care of. And we're a school. So this is the most important thing. Um, I'm always really careful about, you know, the on athletics trying to assess where a kid fits because people think, you know, they go, well, division one is bigger than division two uh, and that kind of thing. And the reality is I think there's, there's a top end of division one that's really elite. And then the rest of it's mostly marketing. Uh, you know, there's, I coached in division three, division two, division one, um, you know, and, and like what's the most competitive. And I think that's, the kids that I coached in division three and, and in division two, we were just as competitive as the D one kids. We practiced just as hard. We practiced just as often. Uh, there's different rules for off season stuff, but when you're in the fall, when you go to the national championship in the NJCAA, that is awesome. And I don't know one kid who was like, you know, that wasn't as good as the NCAA championship we participated in a couple of years later. Cause it, it wasn't. So see you Peyton. But, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, the student experience is really similar at every level. You know, you have a season, you have practice, you go to the playoffs, you have a conference championship, you have nationals or regionals or whatever, whatever it's called. Um, you know, the, I, I don't know that kids are like, the, the, up here there's a junior college conference, the NWAC, and it's great. And all the championships are within like two hours of your house, really, for most kids. And, um, you know, they don't miss out because they don't fly to Texas to play in a regional or something. You know, it's, it's still pretty cool. Um, it's not that it is different, but I think, you know, from a student standpoint or a coach standpoint or a school standpoint, they're pretty similar. So, you know, if a, if a kid, I think when they're looking at schools, like um, helping them, you know, email coaches and the coaches are going to tell them like, hey, you're really not showing the background that we're looking for. And that can help a student assess. I'm, I'm always really careful with that. I had a high school coach tell a kid that they weren't college material. And um, it, it really limited that student. And he would have been an All-American. The coach had no idea what he was talking about. Like he, he wasn't going to be an all, All-American at the University of Maryland, but he sure would have been at Franklin and Marshall. He was a 300-pound tackle. He would have been the best player in that conference at that position. And the coach basically discouraged him from even trying. So my advice is, is try to avoid that. You know, let, let the college coaches tell you what they think and, and encourage that outreach. Are there any other, I mean, my, this, this is your time now. <laughs> I love to model a little bit of wait time too. But I, if you have another question, feel free, jump right in. Uh, you can email me, you can text me. I'll send out the um, 
resume. If you go back through your emails, there's a link to that Google document. Um, this uh, video is going to get posted on Facebook in that high school counselor, school counselor uh, group, and it'll be on uh, our, our Facebook page, College Athletic Advisor. I, I do want to end with a little bit of uh, creative begging. Really hope you'll like our Facebook page, College Athletic Advisor on Facebook. Um, encourage, I'd really encourage your students to check out our website. I think our dual track timeline is really helpful. Um, there's a link where it says at the top, schedule your free appointment on a time available basis. We'll talk to any student for free for an hour. They can do our uh, self-assessment, it's free. I'd encourage you to walk through it with them. It's a great way to have a conversation and it's mostly, it's mostly visual because we found that students reading a lot of stuff was a barrier. And it just gives kids a sort of rough and ready uh, way to assess, you know, hey, these are the things I'm more interested in. Or, and, and just think about, you know, what kind of classroom are you comfortable in? What kind of uh, environment looks good for a college? Just, just to get a basic level uh, of interest. And I think it's just one more tool that you can kind of pull in your arsenal. Obviously, we love uh, referrals and things like that, but uh, really hope you'll help us with uh, liking us on Facebook and just sharing that we, we do exist. And, um, I think we we try to help students kind of where they are and, and be a resource. If you have any questions, my email's on here. Um, you got my phone number. That's my cell. Uh, you know, on the in the emails for the workshop, and I'd be thrilled to talk to anybody individually. If you have questions, want to break out, we can do a Zoom meeting or just talk on the phone. Um, and I really appreciate everybody. You know, if you're a school counselor and you're sitting here for an hour. Uh, we, there's no words for how impressed I am with you and, and how much I appreciate you taking the time to help students. And, and I hope I was a resource. And if there's ever anything I can do going forward to help you, let me know because I'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll always kind of cross the river for anybody who's helping kids. So uh, whatever we can do to be a resource, uh, we're happy to do it. We train, you know, we do trainings for high school coaches, for schools, for parents. We do, you know, if you do a college search night, um, if I don't have to travel, I don't have to charge you. So we can do it on Zoom. If, uh, you know, if you need to, if, if you need me physically, then you got to pay for some time. But, um, but, you know, if everybody's still stuck on Zoom for a while, I know we've got a couple high school nights coming up and, and things like that. So, um, I'd be thrilled to do it. And we're, we're just always happy to reach out and help people. So thank you very much for joining us. It's been my pleasure and I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks. All right, now I'm gonna try to figure out how to shut this thing off. <laughs> <laughs>